case of David versus 19 Goliaths. That is to say, this is not a case of James Boyd versus 19 heavily armed officers, as the state might suggest. It's not that at all. Instead, what this case actually is, is a clash between the duty of the Albuquerque Police Department to provide safety for our community, and at the same time, addressing the danger which Mr. Boyd posed to that community. And more specifically, this is a case about the duty that Officer Pettis had to his fellow officer, an officer who you will come to know as Scott Weimerskirch, to protect him from being stabbed by James Boyd. Now, without question, the evidence in this case will show that Mr. Boyd posed an immediate threat of serious bodily harm to Officer Weimerskirch at the time the decisions were made to shoot and to be also very clear that the assessment of Mr. Boyd's dangerousness was not one based on his economic status or his state of mind. Instead, what it was based upon were the spoken threats which Mr. Boyd made to the law enforcement officers, especially Officer Weimerskirch, the history which, Mr. which the officers knew about of Mr. Boyd's violent towards law enforcement officers and more importantly, the danger that Mr. Boyd posed when he stood above Officer Weimerskirch poised to stab him. That's what this case is about. Now, at the end of this case, you will be tasked with determining the reasonableness of Officer Pettis' use of deadly force. And when you've heard all the evidence in this case, you will know that Mr. Boyd made specific threats to kill officers and specifically threatened to kill Officer Weimerskirch. That Mr. Boyd, at the time he was shot, was armed with two knives, and everything he had demonstrated in the three and a half hours that this standoff was showed that he was capable of using those knives. And more importantly, when Officer Weimerskirch closed the distance on Mr. Boyd, he was only nine feet away. He was in a position where he had no firearm in his hand, and was going to be stabbed if these officers didn't do what they had to do, what their duty required them to do, and that is to protect their fellow officer. Now, this case, has, as, as described by the state, has these clusters of events. First, you have the call by the citizen, Mr. Alan Fixton, uh, to the non-emergency number. There's a dispatcher for the open space officers, followed by the dispatch of the field officers, then there's the dispatch of the tactical officers, and at the very end, my client, Dominic Pettis' dispatch to this particular call. Again, we know that this event happened on March the 16th of 2003, and it spanned time from 3.53 in the afternoon until 7.33 at night. That's when this event occurred. And to know some specifics about it, that the standoff lasted three and a half hours. It's not the two minutes of video some of you may have seen prior to this occasion. Three and a half hours where the Albuquerque Police Department worked diligently to try and negotiate a peaceful resolution with Mr. Boyd. And for reasons that I will explain as we go through the evidence in this case, you will come to understand that it just wasn't going to work with Mr. Boyd because of who he was and what he brought to the table. You will hear that the Albuquerque Police Department officers on 33 different occasions ordered Mr. Boyd to drop his knives. Some of the times he was ordered at gunpoint. Other times he was asked. And then there were other times still where a crisis intervention team officer tried to negotiate the surrender of those weapons in a, in a systematic fashion so Mr. Boyd didn't feel vulnerable. That didn't work either. And during the times that these officers tried to deal with Mr. Boyd, he threatened to kill, and those are the words Mr. Boyd used, threatened to kill the officers 19 times. Now, with regard to the non-emergency calls made by Alexander Fixton, those all happened at 3.53 in the afternoon and 4.24. The first one made by Mr. Fixton, who was a who owned a, a home that was adjacent to the open space. He was approximately a quarter mile away from where Mr. 
Boyd had set up his camp, and he identified Mr. Boyd as someone who he wanted to have a law enforcement response. Now, you will hear Mr. Fix and testify why he chose to call law enforcement as opposed to some other agency, because of his knowledge of what Mr. Boyd had done in the previous month. So you will come to understand that for Mr. Fixton, this was a law enforcement problem as opposed to a social services problem. Finally, at 424, Mr. Fixton determined, because he saw Mr. Boyd return to his camp, called the non-emergency number and let them know that Mr. Boyd had made his way back. Now, at this particular point, I'd like to introduce to you um, an Albuquerque Police Department standard operating procedure. Again, the standard operating procedure, for those of you who are not familiar with it, are basically the rules by which these law enforcement officers are supposed to act. It is governs their behavior, their discipline, if they violate these rules. This is how they're supposed to perform their duty and make assessments. Now, the particular SOP in play here is the use of force SOP. And I'm showing you that particular slide as we, as we look forward. But there's something I want to point to you right from the very beginning. And that is this notion called objective reasonableness. And you will hear, have an opportunity to read what an Albuquerque, how an Albuquerque Police Department officer's actions are judged under the SOP. The standard under which you, all uses of force by an officer are evaluated, that's the objective reasonableness, based on the totality of the circumstances and the facts known to the officers at the time of the incident, the reasonableness of an officer's use of force must be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene and at the time of the action rather than with 2020 hindsight. The United States Supreme Court recognized some allowance must be made for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second decisions with limited information in situations that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolve. In this case, we will present to you the testimony of a police procedures expert named Ron McCarthy. And you will come to know Ron McCarthy as one of the preeminent experts in the field of police procedures. And he will talk to you about hindsight and why it's unfair and, in fact, as the SOPs clearly state, improper to judge an officer's actions with hindsight. Again, hindsight is not only clearer than perception in the moment, but is also unfair to those who actually lived through the incident. That's something that Ron McCarthy will teach you if you don't already know that from your personal life experience. Reality, reality looks much more obvious in hindsight than in foresight. And certainly, hindsight makes past events seem more predictable than was actually the case. So when you look at the evidence in this case, you will look at the SOPs, you will look at our police procedures expert who wants to, who all essentially asks that you don't use hindsight to Monday morning quarterback these officers. We have the dispatch of the open space officers. Now, the city of Albuquerque runs basically three police departments. There's the Albuquerque Police Department, there's the open space officers, and the aviation police. The open space officers are certified law enforcement officers, but they're not members of the Albuquerque Police Department. They're essentially an adjunct. They're the sort of folks that you that enforce the law, but at the same time, you can ask them about the ecology of the Boscus. You can ask them about, you know, the, the different coniferous trees that are out there, there in the open space. They're more park ranger than law enforcement officers, but nonetheless, they're open space officers who work for the city of Albuquerque. We learned that at 4.30 in the afternoon of that day in March, the Albuquerque Police Department, in response to Alan Thixton's call, dispatched two officers to A12 Piedra Vista, A12 Piedra Vista being Alan Thixton's residence. And those are two officers who will testify in this case, Officer John McDaniel and Officer Patrick Hernandez. By 4.41 to 4.48, both officers have arrived at the scene. And what were they there to do? Now, the call was one that open space officers, and they will testify to this, received with regularity, that there are people who are in the public open space and they're living there. It's illegal 
for someone to camp in the open space unless you have a permit. That's pursuant to city ordinance. So these officers were there to investigate a misdemeanor crime. So that was their charge, to go to the open space, determine if someone was actually camping out there, and if they were, to deal with it accordingly. You will have video evidence shown to you about that encounter that Officer Hernandez and Officer uh, McDaniel had with Mr. Boyd. Again, the camera isn't pointing at Mr. Boyd, but what I do want you to focus on, because you don't really see the interaction, are the words used. Officer McDaniel uses a professional tone, talks to Mr. Boyd, and then things go south. Not because he's over-aggressive, but because Mr. Boyd simply won't comply with simple commands to show his hands, which every officer knows if you can't see their hands, you don't know if they're armed or not. So there's a bit of lead up, and you will hear dead air, basically. Uh, the recording doesn't uh, start for just a little bit, but you'll see how the officers are walking up to Mr. Boyd's location. And this is a uh, video uh, from the taser camera video taken by Officer McDaniel.
she took video of these particular events. Time doesn't allow me to show you this, but Alexander Thixton also recorded what the encounter between Mr. Boyd and Officer Hernandez and Officer McDaniel. And you will have an opportunity to see that it's Mr. Boyd who is the aggressor, who's forcing the officers to withdraw. It's not the other way around. Mr. Boyd is the one who's creating the dangerous situation, which warrants these officers' decision to draw their weapons. Now, what weapons did Mr. Boyd arm himself with? Again, he had two knives that he used throughout this incident. The first one is a folding knife. Many of you might have them, but as you, uh, as you know, it is a knife approximately eight inches in length with a blade approximately three and a half inches in, in length, pointed edge and a serrated blade. In the other hand, Mr. Boyd had a similar folding knife. Approximate size, eight inches, blade about three and a half inches. And throughout this encounter, you will hear the officers talk about the knives that Mr. Boyd drew. Those are the knives he had in his hand when he threatened the officers the many times that he did. Now, what about those threats? Again, we don't have time in this opening to present all of them to you, so I'll only present to you a few selected ones. The first one comes from the initial encounter with Officer McDaniel. And you'll learn from the audio that Mr. Boyd says, I'm going to kill you if you try to hurt me. Mr. Boyd, of course, saying that he's bulletproof. A second threat made to Officer McDaniel and Officer Hernandez from Mr. Boyd is, I am almost ready to kill you right now. When asked to take his hand out of his pocket, Mr. Boyd would respond with, I'm almost ready to kill you. The open space officers call for backup, and the Albuquerque Police Department sent field services officers uh, in response. And that happened at approximately 5.02, and their involvement essentially spanned until 6.17 that evening. Officer Hernandez states over the air, and you'll hear this in the dispatch case that will be presented to you. Subject is at gunpoint, air is 10-3. That's all the radio dispatcher needs to know to send backup. And one of the interesting things that you'll come to learn about the way the Albuquerque Police Department operates, and, and many, basically all police departments seem to operate in this manner, is that as radio traffic enters, it, it, is run through dispatch, there is a running history made of what is being said over the air. And that's all part of a computer-aided dispatch system so that any officer who wants to find out what has taken place at a call, they can simply call it up on a computer a mobile device that all officers have, a computer, a laptop, so they can read what has happened and what has been said by the officer in the field. So just because an officer didn't hear the initial radio call, that officer will have an opportunity to read, for the most part verbatim, what was said over the radio, learn when it was happening, so that if an officer is subsequently dispatched, they can come up to speed very quickly on what's happening in the call by simply reading the radio dispatcher's remarks. So that, for example, Officer Pettis, who's not dispatched until long after, after, after has the opportunity to read everything that has happened in this call. 
He does not go in without information. He goes in with the history of the call upon which to base his decisions. So as you begin to learn about what radio dispatches are actually made, know that a radio dispatcher has reduced them to writing and they're available to be read by all officers who are responding to this particular call and that will form their state of mind. That is what they know about Mr. Boyd and the dangerousness that he poses to those officers. In response, the radio dispatcher sends Sergeant Jason Carpenter and Officer Wetterlin as backup. It's important to know, Sergeant Jason Carpenter, he will testify in this trial. And for those of you who had a little background in the military, and maybe for those of you who don't, a sergeant is in charge of officers. He doesn't do the work, he supervises his officers' work. He's there to make assessments about resources, he's there to make assessments about the success of what's being done, and to make determinations of how his officers should respond as this incident unfolds. And his, his testimony is very important because he's somewhat detached. He has the opportunity to see it all happen in front of him, and he's making assessments, not in the moment, but from a, a, an objective perspective. And you will see the assessments that he makes about the lack of progress that's made by his CIT officer, Michael Monet. Additional officers are sent, including CIT officer Michael Monet. Now, to understand what a CIT officer is, to Think to yourself, someone who has been trained by the Albuquerque Police Department to deal with a person in crisis. Again, someone who's emotionally disturbed for reasons the officer may not understand until long into the call, how to try and create a rapport, that is, be able to talk to this person, try to get to the point where there's trust, and then from there try to work on problem solving and maybe achieve a peaceful resolution. There are many techniques that these officers are equipped with. Again, nothing is perfect, as you will find out. Officer Monet goes in with his training and his ability, and the most important tool that any CIT officer has, and that is empathy. And as you will find out that that empathy wasn't enough, to change the way that Mr. Boyd was behaving and the threats that he made. Additional officers began to arrive. Uh, they're on scene by 508. You have Sergeant Carpenter arriving with Officer Wetterling with a beanbag shotgun. Again, a beanbag shotgun is a less lethal tool. And what do I mean by that? If you can imagine to yourself a small sock made out of Kevlar, and that small sock is buckshot, little beads. And it's fired out of a shotgun, and it hits someone with great impact. But because of the way that this sock made out of Kevlar actually expands as it hits somebody, it will not penetrate. It's going to de de deliver a hell of a wallop. It's like being hit by a hammer. But it's not going to kill someone if you're at the right range. So those are the tools that, office, or that Sergeant Carpenter is bringing to the scene. Now, at 5-11, Sergeant Carpenter, who's there watching his officers try to work with Mr. Boyd, has already made the determination that he's 1040. And you'll hear, of course, a lot of police 10 code in this case, but 1040 simply means he's a mental patient, that there's something wrong that makes him an emotionally disturbed person. And again, they're not there to diagnose. They're simply there to assess the crisis and try to bring some resolution to it so that someone else can take over. Because again, they are not mental health care professionals, nor can we expect them to be. They're just simply there to try and defuse the crisis and bring it to a resolution that some, where someone else can take over. Sergeant Carpenter immediately makes the assessment that an ambulance and rescue are necessary. And why do you think that, and, and you know, the reason he does that, Sergeant Carpenter, is that here we have a standoff with a man armed with a deadly weapon. The potential of someone getting hurt is high. So instead of waiting for someone to be hurt, the uh, sergeant or has uh, the Albuquerque Fire Department send a rescue unit, Albuquerque Ambulance send an ambulance that stays a half mile away from the incident. And they were there from, well, essentially once they arrived, I believe it was 520 something, until the shots were fired. So at all times, the Albuquerque Police Department was 
essentially planning for someone being hurt and had the resources there to take care of that problem if it did in fact occur. Now, about Officer Monet. Now, we have video, and again, we don't have time during this uh, opening to present it all. But like I had said before, Officer Monet's greatest tool was empathy. And when you meet him, you'll sort of see why that is. He is that kind of person. But the problem with Mr. Boyd, and it's only knowing that his diagnosis, is that he was a paranoid schizophrenic and he was he had a grandiose disorder. That is, he believed he was a superior to everyone. That no one could tell him what to do. He, Mr. Boyd, was the only one. Mr. Boyd was the guy who told everyone else what to do. And what you will hear in the testimony in this case is that empathy doesn't work with someone who has these grandiose delusions. You can't essentially find a way to essentially convince someone that they're not your superior. It just doesn't work. And that's the challenge that Officer Monet faced, that he had tools to work with lots of folks in crisis. But Mr. Boy offered a problem that he did not have the tools to fix. Now, at 514, Sergeant Carpenter is already making assessments that CIT is there on scene and that Mr. Boyd is not making, uh, is not listening to commands. Again, these are radio dispatches that are reduced to a computer-aided dispatch history that everyone can read as they arrive on scene. At 522, seeing as how Officer Monet isn't making any significant progress, Sergeant uh, Carpenter is making assessments, we need more or less lethal tools. So a decision is made to ask for a taser shotgun. And the request is simply anyone available in the city to show up with a taser shotgun. Again, Sergeant Carpenter is trying to plan a less lethal response and has as many tools available as he can at his disposal so that depending on what Mr. Boyd did, they had the right tool for the job. By 523, Mr. Boyd, again, he's arming himself with his knives, and he was walking towards the officers. And it took a threat of having to beanbag Mr. Boyd to stop Mr. Boyd from closing the distance on the officers. And you will actually see the video of that. Again, Mr. Boyd would only listen to one thing, and that was the threat of force. All of the skills with Mr. Monet brought to this, Officer Monet brought to this, weren't working. It was only the threat of force that kept Mr. Boyd at a distance. Now, at 524, Office, or Sergeant Carpenter asked for a New Mexico State Police Officer. He asked for a New Mexico State Police Officer because Mr. Boyd told the Albuquerque Police Department officers that he would not listen to the APD, but he would listen to the state police. And Sergeant Carpenter, trying to find whatever it is that would work for Mr. Boyd, called for the state police. And two state police officers did, in fact, arrive, and one ultimately tried to negotiate with Mr. Boyd. Again, Sergeant Carpenter is just trying to find whatever it takes to resolve this incident peacefully. Sergeant Carpenter once again gets on the radio at 526 and asks for a police service dog. Now, the one thing a police service dog offers is its ability to bite and hold. Police service dogs don't bite, release, bite, and release, bite, and release like you might have seen other dogs. A police service dog is trained that when it bites, it holds its bite. And the particular breed used by the Albuquerque Police Department, a Belgian Malinois, has a bite that applies approximately 800 pounds of, of, of pressure to the bite. That's like having a refrigerator on your arm or leg. So the pain of that bite will force the person being bitten to focus completely on the pain. And that's when officers can move in 
with the belief that the suspect is so focused on the pain that they won't see the officers moving in, and officers can take someone into custody. That's how a police service dog works, and this particular call might call for that. So that's why Sergeant Carpenter made that request. Again, different officers were being uh, brought on scene because there was different needs as this incident developed. That all began to happen at 5.56 to 7.11 in the evening. At 5.56, that's when Detective Keith Sandy uh, arrives in response to Sergeant Carpenter's request for a taser shotgun. By 5.59, the state police officer is on scene, and what Sergeant Carpenter is relaying on the radio is that state police is on scene, making contact with the subject, Mr. Boyd, but no progress is being made. Sergeant Carpenter reports at 6 o'clock over the radio, and he, of course, will testify that he did so, that Mr. Boyd was asked to put the weapons on the ground, walk to the officers, and Mr. Boyd's exact statement is, he won't submit to anybody. At 6 o'clock, a number of officers begin to arrive. K-9 Officer Renzone, Sergeant Rick Ingram, who will be an officer who's up on the hill when the shooting happens. That's his important. Uh, uh, SWAT Officer Jeffrey McFarland and Sergeant James Fox. They all arrive at about 6 o'clock. Now at 6.04, Sergeant Carpenter will say that he made a request of the Albuquerque Police Department's real-time crime center to run Mr. Boyd. Now, police dispatchers have access to just a limited amount of databases. And, and what the Albuquerque Police Department has developed is essentially a unit that has access to all the city databases, all the regional databases, and all the FBI databases. And these officers are trained how to run searches to determine if there's any information known to law enforcement about a particular person of interest. And that's what the request was made at the Real Time Crime Center to find out what was known about Mr. Boyd. Again, at 6.13, once again, Sergeant Carpenter is relaying over the radio that Mr. Boyd is threatening to hurt any officer who comes close to him. At 6.16, K-9 officer Scott Weinerskirch arrives. Scott Weinerskirch, he's a 16-year veteran of the United States Air Force, where he served as a military police officer who worked with military working dogs. For the most part, those were bomb detection dogs, but that's where his interest began. And now as an Albuquerque Police Department officer, he was a canine officer. And you will learn more about him because he was the canine officer who attempted to use his police service dog to apprehend Mr. Boyd in the moments before he was shot. At 6.17, at Officer Jeffrey McFarland who is a tactical officer, a SWAT team officer, states over the radio that he wants the field services officers who are dealing with Mr. Boyd to come down the mountain because essentially they're too close. Sergeant Carpenter is on that mountain talking to, you know, being involved in the, in the negotiations with Mr. Boyd. A sergeant, you know, an officer doesn't tell a sergeant what to do. Your Honor? I'm told that that could happen, so I just have to turn it on and turn it off again. I apologize. A sergeant, you know, an officer doesn't tell a sergeant what to do. An officer may request for certain activity to take place. Sergeant Carpenter hears essentially the directive from Officer McFarland and he agrees with it. And Sergeant Carpenter will come in here and testify that Officer Monet was not making progress with Mr. Boyd. That taking them off the mountain would not prevent Officer Monet's ability to negotiate with Mr. Boyd because it wasn't going anywhere. They needed to try something different. At 6.33, Officer Weinerskirch, along with other officers, talk with Officer Hernandez and Officer McDaniel. 
And this is what Officer Weinerskirch relayed over the radio based on his conversation with Officer McDaniel and Officer Hernandez, that the primary units, that is Officer McDaniel and Officer Hernandez, had made contact with Mr. Boyd. The subject refused uh, to show his hands, and when the officers attempted to contact him and pat him down, that's when Mr. Boyd pulled out a knife and threatened to kill them. So Officer Wyman Scourge relayed this over the radio. It was reduced by the radio dispatcher to a history on the CAD so that every officer who was arriving on scene would know that Mr. Boyd had, in, in the way that officers look at this, that Mr. Boyd had created, had committed an aggravated assault, an, a, an assault which officers will tell you is an inherently violent crime. Because of course, Mr. Boyd is a violent man, as the evidence will show. Now, once the database at the real time, uh, once the officers at the real time crime center had the opportunity to run the searches that they did, they then relayed the information that they learned. An officer and then Sergeant Carpenter will testify that he heard this. And it was, of course, reduced to writing. It was reduced to writing, and, and you, will, you will learn that different officers then read what the Real Time Center reported. And what did they report? That James Boyd had an extensive criminal history of aggravated battery on peace officers. All officers will testify that that's a thing, you know, again, Mr. Boyd was willing to use a weapon to hurt law enforcement. That's what they knew, and he didn't just do it in Albuquerque, he had done it in various jurisdictions. It was reported that Mr. Boyd is a paranoid schizophrenic, that he is a transient known to frequent public libraries, and to use extreme caution when making contact with Mr. Boyd. So you will hear that radio disc or that radio dispatch in just a moment. and Mr. Boyd. Subject still highly irate, talks about killing officers and making other 
mental patient type remarks. So at 6.59, despite the fact that Mr. Boyd had asked for a state police officer with which to speak, it's not working. At 7.06, Officer Weimerskirch is once again on the radio stating negotiations are not productive. 7.13, Officer Weimerskirch is relaying again on the radio. Subject is highly agitated, keeps pulling knife out of right front parking. And again, there's a number of times that Mr. Boyd threatened Officer Weimerskirch and the other officers who were trying to negotiate with him in that final phase of this particular standoff. And the first one that I'm going to present to you, Mr. Boyd makes the statement, I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. Saying he's got knives out. You want to approach to get killed together? You understand it means you'll get killed together and I'll walk out of here. Mr. Boyd follows up with, that's why I gotta kill you tonight. You want to die tonight. Mr. Boyd states, you're approaching death tonight. It ain't my fault, man. It's your goddamn fault tonight. Now 
728, Officer Weimersberg relayed on the radio, radio, subject not compliant with officer's command and walk, wants to walk down the hill with his bag. You will have Officer we uh, Ingram, another officer who was there on the scene when the shooting happened, tell you that what the officers were willing to let Mr. Boyd do was if you put down the knives, you can walk down, but you have to keep your hands above your head. That was the deal. Mr. Boyd had disarmed before the officers would make, would have Mr. Boyd walk towards them. But what Mr. Boyd will say is that he wants the officers to keep the deal. But the deal wasn't what Mr. Boyd thinks it was. The deal was he walked out of there unarmed. And that's something Mr. Boyd refused to do. And so when he's walking down the hill saying, you know, don't break the deal, that wasn't the deal. The deal, the evidence will show, is for Mr. Boyd to surrender. And that's what he was unwilling to do. And again, throughout all of this, Officer Pettis isn't here. In fact, on this Sunday afternoon, Officer Pettis was celebrating his belated birthday. He had his wife and his three children at his house, along with his mother and his grandmother. And they were celebrating his birthday when he received a call that he was to respond to the foothills to deal with the situation unfolding with Mr. Boyd. So Officer Pettis, answering the call you know, to serve, left his own birthday party to respond to this incident. Officer Pettis arrives at approximately 7-11. And once again, we need to revisit the Albuquerque Police Department standard operating procedures for the use of force. And in those standard operating procedures, you will learn the rule for the use of deadly force. Again, a decision to use deadly force is, according to the SOP, appropriate, proper, if a suspect poses an immediate threat to cause serious physical injury, injury to another officer. So an officer has the right to use deadly force to protect someone else if that someone else is being threatened by an immediate threat of serious bodily harm. And as you will see in subsection B, officers are not required to exhaust less intrusive or less forceful options before resorting to the use of deadly force. If a suspect poses a deadly threat, you are authorized to use deadly force to stop that threat. Now, the Albuquerque Police Department also provides a definition in terms of what is immediacy. Again, an immediate threat that caused serious physical harm. And the definition, an articulable threat that currently exists or may happen within moments, with or without warning. The immediacy of a threat may be assessed through the following legal standards. Intent, the suspect demonstrates his or her intent to resist being controlled or to inflict physical injury, give pre-assault indicators. The means and opportunity, the subject is physically capable of carrying out the perceived threat and is in a position to do so. Intent means an opportunity. Those are key to understanding whether Mr. Boyd posed an immediate threat. That is how these officers are, 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 those are the rules these officers are required to follow. This is the training these officers are required to undergo. If someone has the intent, they have the means, and they have the opportunity, that constitutes an immediate threat. So, at the time the decision was made to take Mr. Boyd into custody, the officers had what they believed to be the charge of aggravated assault. That is, when the initial open space officers arrived, a crime was committed against them, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and with that charge, the officers had the authority to arrest Mr. Boyd. And the fact that Mr. Boyd is mentally ill does not matter. Again, he committed the act of aggravated assault, and that's all that's required to take him into custody and process him through the criminal justice system and lead the criminal justice system, uh, the problem of dealing with how does mental illness play into all of this. Again, Mr. Boyd had been asked before the shooting happened 33 times to drop his knives. 
And at no point did Mr. Boyd ever surrender his knives. Again, he was shot with his knives in his hand. To understand this shooting, you need to undergo a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the video that you will see played throughout this proceeding. And when you have an opportunity to analyze it with that kind of detail and that kind of time, you will come to understand why this shooting happened and why it was a reasonable use of force. Now you can see, and again I didn't mark that, but if you, you can see a motion. That's Detective Sandy throwing a noise flash diversionary device. Now, what is a flash noise diversionary device? It is a device that when it detonates, creates three ways of uh, overwhelming the senses. There's an incredibly brilliant flash, which temporarily blinds. There is this incredibly loud sound that overwhelms a person's hearing. And there is this concussive wave of air that it creates that if you're not ready for it, it'll knock the breath out of you. Again, a flashbang is thrown with the belief that it's going to essentially cause Mr. Boyd to fall to the ground. And our police procedures expert will tell you that in his experience, when flashbangs or noise flash diversionary devices are thrown, 80% of the people who are affected by them immediately go to the ground because their senses are so overwhelmed. Now this device is thrown with the belief that it will incapacitate Mr. Boyd. But as fate would have it, it bounces in front of him and then bounces, it will bounce here. I'm using the cursor to identify a, a boulder, a granite boulder. That's where it ends up detonating. Now you can see in this frame the overwhelming flash of light. And then you will hear the sound and the wave of air that goes not to Mr. Boyd. And as it turns out, goes to Officer Pettis. The effect of the flashbang was directed to my client. And Mr. Boyd was protected by a granite boulder and it had no effect on him, as it turns out. So there was a plan to use other less lethal tools. The first one was the flash noise, or the noise flash diversionary device. And next, as you will see, and what you see here is Officer Pettis moving up, is a police service dog is being released. Now again, the police service dog, as I had mentioned before, will bite and hold with 800 pounds of pressure, hopefully fo forcing Mr. Boyd to focus on the pain and forget for a moment that officers are descending upon him. Over here, I guess in, in your right hand corner, you see this, uh, what looks like a shotgun with a yellow forearm. And that's the taser shotgun. It's being fired at Mr. Boyd. Again, the, the, the taser shotgun, like, a ta like most tasers, delivers 50,000 volts of electricity to the recipient. It causes a tremendous muscular contraction that's incredibly painful. Most people simply fall to the ground in pain. And once that charge is over, that person is fine again. But for that period of time, and the cycle on a taser shotgun is 20 seconds, the officers would have 20 seconds to approach Mr. Boyd, put him in handcuffs before the taser lost its charge. But as it turns out, that failed. Again, their efforts to try and end this standoff with less lethal force are not succeeding. So the first round, taser round, is fired. If you watch that yellow shotgun, you will see that it's being racked. That means that another taser cartridge is being placed in it. We don't see that being fired, but there is evidence, and you will see that evidence in this case, that a second taser round was fired, and it also proved ineffective. Now going back, Officer Weimer Skirch makes a decision, a fateful decision. He decides to follow his police service dog. He's sending his police service dog to apprehend a man who's armed with knives. 
And in doing so, Officer Weimerskirch leaves his cover officer. And he leaves his cover officer with only a leash in his hand. And you can see that Officer Weimerskirch quickly creates distance between officers or uh, Detective Keith Sandy. Why is that? Because Keith Sandy did not know that Officer Weimerskirch was going to leave him, his cover officer, and move up on Mr. Boyd instead of waiting for his police service dog to take effect. And as the video will show, the police service dog never bit Mr. Boyd. And what Officer Weimerskirch will tell you is to this day, he cannot tell you why because he can't ask his dog why the dog didn't bite. So the dog, as it turns out, was sent in the belief that he would be able to you know, basically stop Mr. Boyd from threatening the officers, and that did not work. Something to notice is the light. On Officer Pettis' weapon, there is a light. And when it's turned on, you can see that it illuminates Mr. Boyd. At 7.30 at night in March, it is dark in Albuquerque. This video makes it seem as if it's incredibly well lit. But the reality about this particular camera is it takes ambient light and it magnifies it. So, and you know that why? When the light is on, if it was light out, it would get washed out by the, sun, ray, the sun, rays of the sun. Instead, you see the light to great effect being used on Mr. Boyd. This video misrepresents, not intentionally of course, how dark it actually was. And you know that because now you can see the light. Now, hopefully what you can see very clearly is where Officer Pettis' finger is on the receiver. This is important, very important for you to know. Because as this incident unfolds, you know, and again, every officer is trained, you never put your finger on the trigger until you are ready to fire. Officer Pettis is not jumping to conclusion. Despite all this activity, his finger is on the receiver. It is not moving towards the trigger. Now, there are two occasions where Officer Pettis says, get on the ground. This is the first time he orders Mr. Boyd to get on the ground. We move forward. Officer Pettis, in the belief that maybe verbal commands can resolve the situation, gives him another command to get on the ground. Officer Weimerskirch is running into danger to protect his dog, leaving behind his cover officer and putting the two officers who are covering him in a very difficult situation. Now here, is the point where Mr. Boyd begins to reach for his knives and just simply watch his hands, but also watch the finger on the receiver. Now, at this point, you will see Detective Sandy begin to raise his rifle. For the past hour, uh, Detective Sandy had been watching Mr. Boyd and knew that when he reached for his pockets, the next thing he was going to do was to draw his knives. So for Detective Sandy, as soon as Mr. Boyd reached for his pockets, he knew what was going to happen next. And that's why Detective Sandy began to raise his rifle. Mr. Boyd begins to draw his knives. Another attempt, a third and a fourth attempt by Officer Pettis to try and have Mr. Boyd essentially just go on the ground, to get on the ground. Instead, what does Mr. Boy do? He draws his knives. Again, as you watch this unfold slowly, you see Officer Pettis make the decision that Mr. Boy essentially should be shot because of the level of danger that he poses. Again, Mr. Boy has his knife out, has his knives out, and you can watch the finger. The decision comes first, the action comes subsequent. And that's when Officer Pettis makes the decision to shoot James Boyd when he is facing Officer Weimerskirch, nine feet away from Officer Weimerskirch, armed with two knives. That's when the decision is made. 
Now, Mr. Boyd takes a step, and how do we know that? If you watch the area of light in between Mr. Boyd's legs, you see that the, the light or the light increases. That is, Mr. Boyd takes a step, a step that Detective Sandy believed was Mr. Boyd taking a step towards Officer Weimerskirch. Mr. Boyd dips his shoulder. Detective Sandy fires his first round. Now that round strikes Mr. Boyd in the left arm in his bicep. Again, Mr. Boyd reacts by flinching or turning away from the source of pain. He continues to turn, and then he shot in the right arm, in the tricep. And as described by the state, that was a devastating shot. It was an incredibly devastating shot, causing Mr. Boyd to fall on the ground. The evidence in this case will show that Mr. Boyd went to the ground because he had been shot twice not because he was surrendering. Now as all of this is transpiring and understanding that it's happening at the speed of life, Officer Pettis is trying to avoid shooting his own officers because they're in the way. He has to make sure that his sights are on Mr. Boyd and not his officers. So it's taking time to settle his reticle on Mr. Boyd. And it's in that time trying to avoid shooting, Mr. Sh shooting his fellow officers, that Mr. Boyd begins to turn and begins to fall because he'd been shot. Detective Sandy fires a third round that misses. And you can see the muzzle flash. Let me just move back so you can see the difference. There's a muzzle flash, and that's Officer Pettis' first shot. He fires, and it does strike Mr. Boyd in the back. Officer Pettis made the decision to shoot Mr. Boyd when he was facing Officer Weimerskirch, armed with the knives, poised to stab him, as it turned out, because Mr. Boyd turned and fell because he'd been shot, Officer Pettis shoots James Boyd in the back. That is what happened here, and that's what the evidence will prove in this case. Officer Pettis fires a second shot that misses. Officer Pettis fires a third round that misses. And of course, after his rounds are fired, because he's a highly and well-trained officer, his finger comes off the trigger, goes back on the trigger guard, because this was a trained pattern response. Three rounds were fired as a standard defensive response. <coughs> and when you watch the video with all of that information that Officer Pettis had to internalize and understand, you will understand why officers shouldn't be judged with hindsight that you have to make accommodations for the fact that the situation in which they're involved are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. Officer Pettis made a reasonable decision given this tumultuous, fast-moving situation in which he was forced to make a life, life, and, you know, life or death decision in an instant. This is not murder. This is a reasoned decision to use deadly force that conforms with the standard operating procedures of the Albuquerque Police Department. And I would ask you to see it as such. This is not a crime. This is instead a reasonable decision made by an officer who's only too human. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robles. Just a few minutes before noon, so we'll break for lunch. I'm going to ask that the jury return to the first floor jury assembly room at 1 o'clock. Please stand for the jury.
if everyone will return at one, then we'll start to assemble the jury as soon as you're ready. And we'll start with Mr. Bregman's opening statement. Thank you. Okay.